Hi everyone, my name is Yomi Adegoke. I'm a journalist and co-author of a book called Selene Your Lane and today I'm going to be in conversation with the fabulous Otega Awagba about her new book, Whites on Race and Other Falsehoods. Um, I'm just gonna wait for slightly more people to join in before I start. I really sound like an influencer with that sort of preamble. So um, just give me like two minutes um, more people, namely being a tegger, because <laughs> it really can't start without her. So just give me five. Let's see if she's nearly here. Hang on. Okay, not just yet. One moment. Okay, I might have to manually prompt her. <laughs> Okay. Um, technologically um, apt person on the planet. So let's see how this goes. Oh, she's in. Otega's in. I've just got a WhatsApp. Hello. Hi, Otega, girl. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I was laughing because you were like, can't start the can't start the conversation without her. But I'm here. Jogger. I was just doing filler. Lovely to see you, Ortega. You too. I can't actually see you. Can you not? No. Oh, is that the case for everybody? Oh, God. Hang on. Um, hang I'm on. Just a black box. If, it's, if, if everyone else can see you, that's fine, but I can't see you. I'll put the comments on for like two seconds <laughs> as a test, but... Sorry, I don't... <laughs> the technology, <laughs> I was like two aunties trying to... Um, listen, <laughs> I... I'm I'm so I fly. I literally have a... Okay, can you see us both? Thank you, Jen. Okay, um, okay. Brilliant. Sis. Okay. Otega, how are you today? I'm Miss good. Miss public you? the second time. I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you feeling on your publication day? How is the... How's today been? It's been... It's been good. It's, do you know It's been interesting um, trying to... Well, it's been interesting publishing a book and not being, like, out in the world. Like, basically, like, I've written and launched this book from my like from my like living room from my bed being real being realistic um but it's nice to see it finally kind of out there I've gotten some really great responses I've just been spending a lot of my day on social media and on my phone just like replying to messages um and just kind of seeing how it's going down but it's it's been good it's actually in a way it's quite chilled um just doing it all from home um like not running around to events and stuff so yeah yeah, definitely. I can imagine a nice break. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, by the way, in the comments for confirming that you can not only see us, but see us very well. We appreciate that. Um, so one of my favourite type of in-conversation events are the ones that I do with people I know very well. And I have to pretend that, like, I don't know anything about you and I'm not already a stan <laughs> and that I don't voice note you on a daily basis. So we're going to, like, put all that to one side <laughs> and pretend that isn't the case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you very basic questions like, oh, so what, what led you to write whites? Like, I don't know. So okay. um, for the sake of everybody in the audience, what is whites about? If you had to do your elevator pitch and just summarize it, what would you say whites is about? Whites is, as the title suggests, about white people um, and about what's required to kind of coexist with them and, and navigate white spaces if, if you yourself are not white, so if you're black. And just, you know, the kind of unbelievable psychological and emotional toll that takes. Like I really wanted people, white people, to understand what it involves kind of having to navigate them and having to navigate white spaces. And it's also a bit broader in terms of, it's also obviously a response to George Floyd's murder back in May and to the white responses to that murder and, you know, the subsequent protests and, and riots and the social media stuff. And it provoked a lot of feelings in me, um, a lot of discomfort in me. And so it just felt like something that I needed to write. Like I'd been sort of working on the ideas in the essay for like a couple of years and wanting to write certain things about racism and whiteness and navigating whiteness. And then after George Floyd was killed, it was just this like explosion of, I guess, conversation, discourse, and it just felt like now was the right time to put it out there. 
Thank you so much. And Lowe's, Lowe's Mem, I think um, her act's pronounced, said that she thought it was such a bold title, which is when you sent me, when you were like, this is what it's going to be called, called, I think you remember my reaction was like, <clears throat> well, <laughs> that's, that's quite a name. I mean, it's a fantastic name. It's a thought provoking name. But how did you arrive at that name, first of all? And second of all, were you afraid of potential backlash and pushback for a name that is that bold as Lois Mem or however her at is pronounced said? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, the working title for the essay from when I've been working on it from like a year or two ago was something quite different and not, not as good. And literally at this stage that I was submitting the proposal to my publisher, I was like, mm, I'm just really not feeling the title. And I literally just sat down and looked at, let's say the first two or three paragraphs of the proposal like written, which is kind of like the summary of what I wanted to write. And I was like, what's this essay about? It's about white people, it's white. I was like, white, it's like it really just came to me in like two or three minutes of just like looking at the text. I was like, there wasn't a big thought process into it. And it just seemed, I, I did, maybe it was a little bit kind of tongue in cheek, like, I think amongst within black spaces and amongst black people, there is a kind of slightly jokey thing of re referring to white people as whites. Um, so for me, this was kind of like a little nod to that as well. I mean, in terms of provoking backlash, I was sort of prepared for that, but also you can't say anything about race or racism without getting backlash from white people. So it's like, it's gonna be, and also it's not offensive. Like I think, you know, the thing about the title is that white people are not used to being spoken of as a collective and homogenized or othered in that way. And I was really kind of trying to flip that slightly um, in the same way that I think, you know, black people are usually othered. I was like, I'm going to flip this and kind of make white people and whites the kind of like foreign entity in this. So yeah, it was deliberately provocative, but um, it seems to have gone down well with white people as well. So, <laughs> um, so speaking of your white audience, I mean, it's interesting because obviously I'm somebody that talks and writes about race and racism, quite frankly. But honestly, even I think the way, the candidness with which you discuss whiteness as a, um, you know, system and you discuss white people, it even makes me like, oh, rah, like you're, you really don't mince your words. And I think it's important because in this climate, what we need is basically um, facts. We really don't need dancing around these conversations. So in terms of who you would say you have written this book for would that be black people white people who would you say you've written it for uh definitely both i mean that was a big big sort of question or dilemma that i had to reckon with when i sat down to write the essay so even before i sat down to write anything i had like a big just personal dilemma in my in my mind about who i wanted this essay to be for um because i didn't want to write and I, I talk about it a little bit in the essay, but I didn't want to write another one of these kind of like anti-racist allyship handbooks that seem to have just like exploded out of nowhere ever since George Floyd was killed. And even before George Floyd was killed, like these books about racism and race that are directed at white people. I was very, very certain I didn't want to write that because I also don't like the way some of those books are kind of manipulated by white people and kind of weaponized as a kind of like insurance against possibly being thought of or accused of racism. So I, I very much knew I did not want to write a book about race or racism for white people, even though it is, you know, largely about them. And I was like, I want other black, it was so important to me that other black people would read this essay and feel like it was for them and feel like it's, you know, directed towards them, feel like they get something out of it, feel like they feel like vindicated or gratified. However, I was also aware that white people were going to be reading this. Like I exist in a lot of white spaces. I know I have, you know, followers who are white and a white audience as, as well as a black audience. And I mean, it has their name on the title. So I knew that white people were going to be reading this. So I guess the challenge for me then was just to try and, the biggest challenge was trying to write the essay in such a way that it spoke to multiple audiences, which I'd like to think that I've achieved. It's just that, black people and white people are going to take very very different things out of it so i said you know i want black people to feel vindicated and gratified and and seen and i think for white people i'm expecting them to just feel very uncomfortable um with with the essay and how did you strike that balance because as you said it's not an easy one to strike 
So how, what were you, I guess, practically, what were you, what was your thought process in making sure that you were still validating and centering black people whilst obviously having this discussion that was about white people essentially? Yeah, I guess the way I did that was by not kind of mollycoddling white feelings. Um, I don't think I'm, that's something that I do anyway. I'm not really, I'm I think I'm pretty, it. say that again. I know, I was going to say, I was about to say, that's definitely not something you've ever done. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, mm, a real departure for me was to, no. Um, I think I just made sure that even in terms of how it was addressed, and, you know, I remember kind of asking my editor, there was one section I was like, well, this section is clearly addressed or, you know, directed at white people, but then does that imply the whole essay is directed at white people? Like, it was very much kind of, like, reading it and looking at who who does this sound like it's addressed to? So kind of more of like a... Like language thing um, and, and kind of trying to almost kind of maintain a, a sense of neutrality in, in who it was addressed to but also I think I try to do that in terms of the stuff that I included like I, I think from the responses I've had from some black people so far if you've read it is that they felt like it's sort of like the kind of conversations that we have in the whatsapps about white people is kind of like suddenly gone like mainstream um and that was deliberate i was like i i was like, i'm gonna talk the things like, i'm gonna say what's honest um and yeah i i, I hope I, the feedback i've had so far has been has been good from black people so i'm happy with that so can you define what i mean obviously as you said there's been a real conversation around allyship and what that means um and there have been lots of books that you know post george floyd have commented specifically on allyship i'm interested in what if anything <laughs> i'm really looking at your face <laughs> what allyship means to you if anything <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'm laughing because i know you know the answer but <laughs> i just i don't think allyship is really a thing um and i you know i was very familiar with the term before george floyd was killed as i'm sure you were as would any kind of black person who kind of engages with race and academic writing and that kind of thing um and social justice issues and I'd never really questioned it before I'd almost kind of like blindly accepted it but it was actually only because of the number the volume of responses after George Floyd was killed where a lot of pe white people were kind of saying I want to be an ally I am an ally this is how allyship is done that I really started to really like critically examine this concept because something at its core was making me feel uneasy and what I realise is that the kind of mainstream conception of allyship, so the kind of conceptions that I think are kind of perpetuated by some of these, you know, handbooks that, I've, that I refer to, is it's very easy. It's like, oh, patronise black businesses and amplify black voices and read black black writers. And I'm like, these, these things are like quite easy to do. They make they make you feel good. They make you look good. And the things that I think would really constitute true allyship would be white people giving up their white privilege. And I think at the moment we're stuck at white people should acknowledge their white privilege. And then it's like, well, what do we do now? So you've told me that you're white and you get stuck because of that. Like, what am I supposed to say now? I'm like, you have to take it one step further and reject the advantages that you get in life because of, of your because of your whiteness and because of my blackness and I don't see that many people willing to do that so you know it's like it's about turning down jobs and turning down money and turning down opportunities and thinking about how if reparations aren't well they're not currently happening on a structural and wider political level and god knows if they ever will happen but it's about how can you enact that on an individual basis like we all know that there is an ethnicity pay gap that means white people, um, you know, it depends on your race and gender. It depends on your gender and sex and that kind of thing. But, you know, white people earn more than black people doing the equivalent jobs. Like, what are you doing with that extra money? Because you're getting that because you're white. So, like, you, you can kind of, like, bemoan the system and say, oh, no, like, racism is so bad. But it's like, OK, what are you going to do in your individual life to actually change things? I think a lot of the conversations about allyship are kind of treated as this, like, charitable act for white people to do on behalf of black people and I'm like actually just focus on yourselves for a bit like how are you going to change your life and how are you going to try and redistribute privilege how are you going to try and redistribute power and that means redistributing it away from yourself thank you so much Otega I'm, I'm really surprised we're getting a lot of like positive affirmation in the comments which I initially had turned off so thank you everybody because I was like 
I'm not sure if everybody's ready to hear this, but it looks like perhaps they are at this point in time. So when you showed me your initial title, you showed me two different um, subtitles. And I can't remember the other one, but mm. I remember the one that I liked most is the one you went with, mm. Omri and other falsehoods. And I was like, that, that, that is, those are the bars that we need to hear. Can you talk to me a little bit about the falsehoods that you refer to within your title? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. I haven't actually had many people ask me about that. Um, I spent ages trying to, so in publishing, <laughs> um, so I had the title Whites and that was like good to go from the get go. But then there was a space of about two or three months when publisher and my editor rightly said that it needed a subhead to kind of explain what this book about because Whites could literally be anything. It could be about pain. It could be about DIYs. They're like, you need a, a subhead, which is pretty common with books. And so I spent months just like, writing things down like I still have like a list of stuff on my phone that I was considering and nothing really felt right and I was trying to you know I was trying to like give a teaser of what the um essay is about and kind of sum it up and in, in the end I realized okay well, what's it about and I think the essay is about a series of falsehoods so there is the falsehood of race which I talk about in the essay and how race is a social construct and you know I, I i kind of expand on it in the essay about how kind of whiteness has been defined over time based on various social and political and economic kind of incentives and imperatives um you know there are certain people like for instance irish people or italian people who have in the past been discriminated against because of kind of like perceived racial difference either in both in the uk and in the us but then have kind of over time gained the privileges that afforded to other white people for various reasons. And there's there's lots of scholarship on that and I talk about it in the essay. So one of the falsehoods I talk about was race. The other one was kind of my own falsehood and the veneer that I sometimes offer and that a lot of black people put up that kind of disconnect between what we're really thinking and what we're actually saying now every black pe person will understand what I'm talking about, which is basically sometimes you're in a white space and someone says something kind of off or there is a conversation being had and you're just like, what are these people talking about? But you have to like keep a face. Maybe it's a professional situation and whatever. So it's like that kind of disconnect between my outward, I guess, expressions or, or what I'm saying and what I'm inwardly thinking. Um, so that was kind of like another falsehood. That's like my own falsehood. And then the last one was just the falsehood of allyship. Like I, spoiler that I don't really believe in it. I don't really believe it's it's a thing definitely not under the current conception of it so for me those felt like the big three falsehoods that I touch on through the essay and and when I'd landed on that I was like oh okay that's it that sums up the essay this is what it's about thank you so much Otega so guys if you want to ask questions I'm sorry I've seen some like lit, genuinely excellent questions like zoom by focusing on mine so if you guys want to ask questions please do in the next sort of five minutes, drop them in the comment box because I'm not currently taking them at the moment, but please do drop them because I saw some really good ones. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the, um, I, you know the, you know how white people often kind of like, you know, prefix, like, you know, here's a qualifier. Some of my best friends are black. You obviously have a lot of white friends <laughs> and I'm super interested in how that sentiment of like okay look I because obviously you touch on it in the book but having good people in your life that are white but also despite being good people don't necessarily understand like the nuances and you know realities of racism so I'm interested in whether what the reactions from your white friends have been if any and if any of them have expressed their um, opinions on this work because obviously you, you you quite heavily reference experiences that you've had with with white people that are close to you uh, so the book has just come out today, so most of my friends haven't read it, most of my white friends haven't read it yet, so I will come back to you on that in like a week's time. But I mean, in terms of what has happened with our conversations on race before today, I've I've been quite, um, I think I mentioned the essay and I know I've talked about it with you, like I had a lot of very difficult conversations with some of my white friends um, after George Floyd was killed and all of these kind of bigger broader conversations were happening about race and racism and it, it you know it brought up you know I guess some like some things that I had been holding back and you know f for obvious reasons after George Floyd was killed it prompted conversations about race between black and white people and so obviously that happened to me and my friends and yeah we just had to have a lot of difficult conversations about times that I 
had felt, I don't know, maybe let down or felt like they hadn't engaged with my experience as a black person and as a black woman especially. And I think for me, whereas in the past, probably in, in years gone by, especially when I was, you know, younger and less uh willful I want to say less willful but I've always been quite willful I would say when I was younger and le less hardline about what I will and won't tolerate in my friendships um I was probably more willing to make allowances on that subject but I think the older I get and the more I kind of engage in this sort of work and the more that I realize how central to my life experience my being black is the more I'm like I can only have people in my life who are on board with that um so yeah there was some difficult conversations and I think you know it's an ongoing thing it's like but yeah it was it was a difficult and stressful time um and yeah just you know I'll come back to you in a week's time maybe we'll do a follow-up <laughs> um with, um with Stones live after they've read it I don't know I'm certain I'll know in a few days weeks with a very long voice note so I want to pick up a quote. There are loads of quotes that just massively kind of like, I feel just just completely embody what my thought process has been over the past few months. But one in particular that I want to touch on is this one, where you say, occasionally I found myself added to the social media version of these roundups. And these are like these roundups that spoke about, you know, like anti-racist um, activists and educators and, and works that you needed to, um, that white people essentially needed to engage in. So I occasionally, occasionally I found myself added to the social media version of these roundups with no actual mention of my work, which I took to mean that my entire life might be considered an anti-racist reading list, existing solely to facilitate white people's moment of moral awakening. I flinched at the thought of some hopeful voyeur observing my day-to-day -day life, photos of the food I was eating, or my thoughts on a movie I'd seen, and considering that to be part of their anti-racist training. Now, that really hit because that period, especially immediately after George Floyd's death, where people, and I do think in a, in a well-meaning way, were trying to compilate, like, um, you know, works and peoples and, you know, just anything that they felt um, other people should be following to basically become less racist, for lack of a better phrase. I'm interested in what you think, obviously it's clear from the book what you think about that, but how do we deal with that phenomenon, especially when at times the people that are actively encouraging that are anti-racist activists themselves? Often you do get minority people that are saying, follow this account, buy this book and you'll be cured of the scourge of racism. How do we stop that from happening? Or I guess a better way of putting it would be, how do we, gosh, I said that as if I knew the better way of putting it. <laughs> I guess I'm just interested in, the fact that it is often minority people that are pushing that alongside, you know, white people are scrambling to look less, less racist. How do we stop that kind of happening? I mean, I think from a kind of minority point of view, don't assume that other people's boundaries and comfort levels are the same as yours. Um, you know, sometimes I felt like when I was added to these things, it's like, why don't you ask my permission first? Like, why don't you ask me if I feel comfortable with this? Why don't you ask me if I want to be added to this list of, you know, there's a there's an element of laziness there where it's quicker for people to screenshot and put it up without bothering to message you, maybe wait a few hours for you to respond, all of these sorts of things. But it's like, maybe ask if I would welcome an influx of white followers, which is what I got, and which I was like, oh man, like I was like, this is gonna be some bullshit, like, on my Twitter, for instance, the month after George Floyd was killed, I got so much more trolling and so many more like weird messages because I'd had all these white followers who just didn't really know what I was about, kind of followed me because they thought it made them look good. And then I just suddenly started getting like, not loads of abuse, but just like a really marked uptick in, in the month since, um, which has thankfully died down. I mean, I think, yeah, to minority people doing that, if you're cool with that, that's fine. But like, I was not. And the thing that I really objected to as well was, I had not at that point written about race, really. Um, I, you know, hadn't written the essay. My last book was about um, careers. It didn't mention race at all. And so it just felt a little bit dehumanizing and reductive to just kind of flatten me into, by virtue of being black, into like a kind of walking, talking, like racial educator. And it's like, that's not what I see myself 
as and that's not what I am that's not what I purport to be um I think it's also dangerous as well because like some of the people I saw added to these roundups I'm like that person doesn't know what the hell they're talking about so I just think people were like there was this flurry of activity um and I think people should have been more thoughtful about it um and thought more about what they were hoping to achieve and I guess maybe people think it's like a compliment because they're like oh I'm sending followers your way but I just I just kind of thought it was a bit mad all a bit mad really I don't know how did you feel about it because I know it must have happened to you as well oh I was how did I feel about it I felt I think I felt very similar to you in terms of I mean obviously I, I'd written about race extensively, extensively but there's I mean it's just interesting that I don't think many people wake up and the first thing they think about is their experience as a black woman in this country. Their the experience as a black woman in this country informs so much about who you are, but I've never woke, I've never sort of sat there and seen myself as Yomi subtitle, the black British woman. Like I've always just been me. And I think it was interesting to see how my rent was, you know, it, it was, it was, I don't know, the lens through which I was seen, it became so myopic and so kind of specified in terms of, you know, I write about reality TV. I write about all kinds of other things. It was like, don't come to her for any of that. She's black. <laughs> she's, she's a black correspondent. Come to her for all of that. And I it just, yeah, it was it was a lot. And and that's the thing you said as well about your follower count going up um, massively at one, massively spiking. And is it really useful if those people that are following you are then going to be very, you know, uncomfortable with the things that you then go to to speak about because they're not actually following your own volition is to look less racist and, and also they're probably going to be disappointed because three quarters of the time i'm just chatting absolute crap on my instagram so i'm i just kind of feel like if yeah. someone's promised you some kind of like racism 101 seminar you're going to be very disappointed by my instagram oh my God. So. literally just but but fabulous shoes i mean if they're, if they're always instagram, always with the shoes, fabulous shoes like for real but yeah um, likewise, I, I sat there thinking, God, I talk so much garbage ninety percent of the time. Like, I really this isn't gonna this is probably gonna make you more problematic if you follow me. But anyway, right? <laughs> so Charlie Kramer in the comments made a very good point, which was that this all kind of comes down to white people wanting to seem less racist rather than be less racist, which a lot of people have kind of um, thumbs up to, and I think that is a, a really good point. Now, there's a bit in this essay that actually made me cry laugh which is when you started talking about the infamous um i don't know if it's infamous because i feel like it was just a small group of people that actually realized how funny it was but the amplify melanated voices um <laughs> like i'll tell you i'm trying to be i'm trying to get my fun cotton on i'm trying to be serious like i know Sorry. don't make me collapse <laughs> but the amplify melanated voices <laughs> Yeah, I had I just had a lot of feelings about that phrase. Sorry, do you carry on? Do you carry on? That tag, okay, so that tag obviously in terms of title was just you know, as you said in the book, what what makes a voice melanated? Like just the whole semantics of that phrase were, was off. What I'm interested And it's also the use of the passive. I know I don't want to be like a like a language nerd, but like the, the use of the passive, it's like um, the voice has been melanated. <laughs> I was just trying to, it's, it's so, on so many levels, it just didn't gel with me, but do you carry on? That just killed me, that you were so enraged by that, and obviously it's something that a lot of us privately were kind of, you know, a bit like, oh, interesting turn of phrase. What I found really interesting, though, is that, you know, your book is probably one of the only, I mean, I guess I've been off, I'm not on Twitter as much, so maybe there was more criticism on Twitter, but it's one of the only spaces that I saw people, someone actually be openly kind of critical of how ludicrous, how ludicrous that phrase was so what i was interested in is why do you think we are so cautious about calling out or, or being openly critical of i guess anti-racist actions that in reality are a bit silly mm -hmm. or, or do come across a little bit you know because obviously i guess it's well-meaning so there's that kind of you know you don't want to be too critical but i'm interested that amplified melanated voices which was so silly I'm shocked that no one else, including my, including myself or my excuses, I'm not on social media as much anymore. Why do you think so, <laughs> that's my get out clause, why do you mm. think I'm willing to openly critique these kind of initiatives? I think because there's, a, you know, then you get a lot of white people and, and perhaps understanding me being like, okay, well then what do you want us to do? Like, we're trying to help. And like, you know, I've, I've seen that reaction already play out in terms of responses to 
my book and interviews I've done and also just like at the time where white people were kind of being like oh well like we're trying to help like black people and it's like these ungrateful blacks kind of narrative where it's like well what do you want us to do then and I think people want to recognize or black people want to recognize and acknowledge that white people are trying to help but I'm like it doesn't it doesn't serve anyone to allow people a kind of false sense of security about their efforts and to make them think that they're more helpful than they actually are to to not even tell them that they might be harmful or you know hurtful or damaging or whatever um so i'm here to tell those home truths but i I think so on the one hand it's that like it kind of provokes a response in white people that they feel like they're damned if they do damned if they don't which to an extent i get but i'm like there are actually things that i think white people could do that would be helpful as i detail in the book i just don't think that they're willing to do them so you're not damned if you damned if you don't it's just that you're not willing to do the things that i think will be helpful but also you know the whole like concept of allyship i remember when i first started having doubts about it um you know back in like june i texted a black friend of mine and i was like babe i was like i'm really not sure about this whole allyship thing like, i'm really skeptical about it i'm really not like i just don't really think it's a thing and she said to me, and I was like, oh, I'm thinking about pitching and writing something about it. And I just wanted to write like a quick like 800 words somewhere. And she, you know, and I really respect her opinion. And she was like, oh, but then it was almost like, don't say that. Because then that will like discourage white people from trying to help if they feel like their efforts aren't being recognised. Or if they feel like someone is telling them that it's not possible for them to be an ally. Then they'll be like, oh, why should I even bother so I think there is this thing of like not wanting to like discourage white people from whatever efforts they might be willing to take which I suppose is fair enough but it's like it's almost as if I'm out there like you know hammering on white people's doors and like telling them off I'm just I'm just speaking very very plainly and I don't think it serves anyone we're all adults here like you know this isn't a book for 12 year olds all adults here it doesn't serve anyone to be to mince their words and, and to to kind of mollycoddle um, to mollycoddle them. So I th- yeah, I think that's why maybe people didn't pick up certain things. Um, the melanated voices thing, yeah, I don't understand that one. Um, I, I think the thing about that I presented about that it was like this like new phrase that kind of came out of it, nowhere. And without kind of doing any kind of like fact checking or sense checking or critical thinking like about this phrase and its orig- origination, people just kind of like repeated it ad infinitum. And and I think that's kind of the nature of how social media works. People were just kind of like repeating and parroting things without really thinking yeah. critically about it. Um, and I think that's why I particularly took umbrage with that phrase because it just kind of seemed to encapsulate a lot of what was going wrong on social media at the time. Thank you so much, Otega. Now, as I said at the beginning, I am literally a technological auntie, so please bear with me, guys. I'm doing my best, (laughs) can you not, to answer questions. (laughs) So I've literally taken it way back to like the start of the um, live to Jumanji, who said, how is the message going to reach those white people that don't engage with anti-racism books, etc.? Oh, God, what have I done? Sorry, hang on. (laughs) Okay, um, I'm going to break this thing. Go on, Otega. Um, how is it going to reach the people who don't engage with anti-race books? Um, I don't want to be flippant, but it probably won't. Like, um, I'm. I suppose maybe they'll hear about it from their white friends or white partners or white, you know, family members who have read this book um, or this essay, but. Yeah, I don't know. If, if 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 white people aren't interested in reading these sorts of books, then there isn't really anything I can do about that. Sorry, mm-hmm. if I, I'm not trying to be flippant, but I'm just like, I, I, I don't know um, is the answer. Brilliant. Honestly, the brilliant thing about the essay is that you don't claim to. And I think that's yeah. what's really, when you, when, I think one of the problems with being an author and being what's considered an authoritative, authoritative voice on something is that there is an inference that you are saying you have the answers and you've con- made a conclusion and you haven't other than that your conclusion has i mean in the essay is very much that there are ways to be a better ally but you understand most white people are willing to do what it takes and that's like a fair conclusion to draw but 
there's nothing in this book that would suggest you have the answer to that. Do you get what I mean? So, but I do think it's difficult when you even broach certain subjects that it feels like you kind of have to be like, and this, guys, is how you solve racism. It's like, okay. yeah. You don't know. <laughs> I was yeah, and I was quite prepared for those sorts of questions. Um and I've you know, had a few of them in interviews and stuff and I completely understand them. But I'm just very happy to hold my hands up and be like, I know what I know and what I've what I know I've put in the essay and yeah. I don't see myself as like this like I I don't see myself as a coach for white people, you know, and I also don't I don't purport to kind of have the answers on how to um, you know, physically dismantle structural racism i just know that i feel like my contribution to that effort is by just speaking plainly and telling the truth and that's kind of within my skill as a writer um but also i'm like the onus is not on like more generally obviously i know that was a specific question about um how to reach you know white people who have like their heads in the sand but like i'm like i i can't dismantle racism myself as a black person like it requires white cooperation which is kind of something that I talk about in the essay so sometimes I have these things where people are like okay so what do we do next and I'm like well why don't you tell me um so yeah thank you I hope that helped answer your question um next is from Juba Music London I saw this ages ago and I've been like literally gagging to ask it which is where do other people of color come into this as anti-blackness is prevalent amongst more or less all non-black communities? I think that's a fantastic question. Mm. And I was really conscious when I was writing the essay that it was written as though there are two races in the world, black and white. And I obviously know that's not the case, but I did still make a very specific decision to talk about just black people and white people because A, that I think in terms of responding to Black Lives Matter, it was very much a conversation about anti-blackness and anti-black racism and then white people are obviously the kind of like, I don't know what's called, dominant race. I don't like that phrase, but you know what I mean. Um, mm. You know, it's kind of both. I I read this really interesting article in The New Yorker over the summer about why we should maybe actually start to... It kind of persuaded me to use the term people of colour more because I know that there are so many conversations that I've had with other black people about the fact that, you know, the black experience is very different to the Asian experience. And, you know, there are kind of, there's kind of like anti-black racism within people of color. Um, and I, I just felt, I basically felt like torn between, if I were to recognize that, to write about that, I felt torn between recognizing that fact and the anti-black racism that happens amongst people of color and the role that they play in, I guess, kind of trying to assume proximity to whiteness or kind of trying to leverage what proximity to whiteness they have and the extent to which often the way to kind of you know historically the way to kind of gain the advantages of the dominant race has been to kind of push down black people but also I kind of want to be a little bit more charitable and also recognize that um other people of color also suffer from racism and it takes a very different form. And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm basically just kind of like coming round slightly on the idea of there being, there are obviously very different experiences of racism under that umbrella of person of color, but I kind of want to not dismiss out of hand the fact that non-black people of color do also experience racism and, and have a long history of it. And if you look at colonialism and Indians and, and that sort of thing, so, yeah, I'm I'm still kind of, I'm on the fence about that, which is also why I, I didn't write about it. Because what I felt like, I was like, I would love, like an Asian person, like a brown person, whatever, to write something about what it's like being in that in-between space, mm -hmm. where you have certain advantages, or, you know, or you don't suffer certain things, but where also you might perpetuate racism yourself, but then also you are also subject to racism. I thought that would be really interesting and I remember I was thinking god I would love someone to write the like Asian version of this essay but that that person isn't me mm -hmm. I'm really honestly glad that you said that because I do think especially with the online discourse um that gets lost essentially it gets lost it gets lost and I, I can see why because there it, there is so much there can often be a lot of anti-blackness from I think in particular the Asian community but also kind of some Arab culture as well but yeah like Asian people like we've heard stories and you know what happens and you know 
a friend of mine had racial racial abuse on the street the other day and she's not black so i i just don't i don't want to get into i think it can get a little bit competitive yeah in terms of who has been oppressed the most and obviously i think there is a very specific black experience that in in a lot of cases and even if you look at kind of statistics it's like very clear that racism kind of falls heaviest on black people but i don't want to yeah, I kind of want to be a little bit more open about that. It was a very convincing article um, in the New Yorker. Actually. I'll tweet it out after this because it was it was really good, and I think I think a lot of black people should read it. I'm really, as I said, I'm really really glad that you said that. Um, and funny enough, it was a conversation I had with a brown person, so to speak, a grandfather, that really made me realise that you know when you there are situations essentially in atrocities and and racisms plural in this country that do affect basically people that just their commonality is simply that they're not white and and regardless of anti-blackness that may take place in those communities that is the case and you know trying to leverage perceived proximity to whiteness to then be anti-black is is kind of almost its own conversation it doesn't it doesn't undermine the fact that those people are going that doesn't cancel it out but I think people are, are treating it as though it does, and exactly. and and I and I don't want to be part of that. And I because I sometimes think I was like, wow, it must be interesting as an Asian person to kind of watch these conversations happen, and maybe to read my essay. And yeah, it sounds as though like black people and white, you know, there's the only two races, and black people are the only people that suffer from racism, and that isn't the case. I, I, I you know, it's a person I say so. I spoke to my own experience, and as I said, George Floyd is very much about like blackness and whiteness but that is a conversation that I would I would love to have more and I would love to read more about like a kind of like Asian response to this moment and also to to my essay even. Thank you Otega, love, genuinely loving the nuance and Lou, Lule, oh okay, I, because I'm an auntie I have messed that up and she's gone so we're gonna ask a different question which is, hang on, god this is what happens when you don't know what you're doing okay so someone has said hold on i think it's helpful to have allyship in the corporate context which gives them tangible actions to take which leads on from another question which was from lule lule which was do you think that in the same way the ethnicity pay gap sorry the gender pay gap is um published would you say that it would be useful to publish the um, ethnicity pay gap? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And I think it's funny. I feel like there, I was actually, because, you know, there was a petition that went around a couple of months ago, um, a while ago that I signed, and then I got an update from like the .gov. And, you know, I think the government is, you know, allegedly considering it and they're kind of reviewing it. And I read the report on why they haven't implemented it so far. One of the things they mentioned which I hadn't really factored in was the kind of complexity of um, essentially categorizing people racially. So I think, you know, when it comes to gender, things are a bit more black and white. It can be, you know, you can identify as male, female, non-gender, you know, uh, non-binary. So it's like, there is, I guess there's like discrete categories, but with race, it's different. And then also it's like, well, what if you are a white person, passing person of color, like, Anyway, they was essentially saying that it requires a lot more nuance, but I don't think that's an excuse because I do still think it can be done. And look, we have so much, you know, there, the Office of National Statistics has thousands of charts and data that are categorised by race. So if they can do it, then the government can do it. I think it'd be amazing, but I think part of the reason people are shying away from it is because sometimes with like gender inequality, it can kind of be like, kind of like, I don't want to say sexed up, but it can kind of like, be like beautified into this like yay feminism we're gonna smash the glass ceiling and we're doing i don't think people are as ashamed to underpay women or feel like it reflects as badly on them as it does people of color i think people are way more embarrassed about racism than they are about um sexism and how that um portrays in the workplace because also there are a few companies i think i can't remember the top of my head i I know one of the big five publishers has done it who have voluntarily released their ethnicity um pay gap stats but uh, yeah i think which means a lot more people could do it but i think people are mortified to do it which is why they're not doing it um 
but yeah I think it'd be incredibly helpful but also I'm like helpful but then to what end like the thing that I always feel like with, with these reports is they release but there are no targets like what if the com what if the government find people for ethnicity pay gaps like people kind of need a bit of a motivator like I get really sick and tired of all these like diversity charters and initiatives and things that get written up and targets five-year plans that get set where companies kind of make all these pledges to to do things differently but as long as you know you need to incentivize people so if you know a company ceo's bonus or salary was part dependent on, on you know achieving certain ethnicity parity i'm sure things would move a lot quicker but i think at the moment it's very easy for people to pay lip service so like yeah it'd be great to have ethnicity pay gap stats released but i also think there needs to be because it's illegal it's illegal to pay people less because of their skin color so it's like well if it's demonstrated that you're paying people less in your company because of skin color like what, what are the ramifications of that going to be but then you know corporate life is what it is people start fudging the numbers so again i don't have the solutions there Thank you so much, Tega. I think we have time for literally one last question. Um, also to reference, um, I can't remember their name, Arts by Primo. You said I'm not being critical enough of you. It's because I agree with everything Otega's saying. So I'm not going to be. <laughs> unless I, if they said there's not enough critical thinking going on, but there is because I'm not going to be unintentionally, um, sorry, unnecessarily critical of something that I agree with. So that's, <laughs> I'll do that on my own behalf. And in terms of Jim B. Bob, um, do you think life is different now for younger black women compared to when you were young? God, that makes us sound like we're super old. But yeah. I know. It's, <laughs> yeah, okay. it's me. So. I'm 30, so let's, like, let's have some a bit of respect, first of all. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I definitely feel like, I think identity and black identity and, you know, a lot of the burden that black women have to carry black people have to carry is spoken about so much more openly now than it wasn't like something like you know yomi when i read slay in your lane i was like i really and i know it's such a cliche thing to say but i was like i really really wish i had had this book when i was a teenager like so so much i wish these conversations were happening and now they are like the people who are young teenagers now and you know even in their early 20s um they're having these conversations i think we're a lot more open about race i think we are more confrontational about race and racism than certainly when i was younger um so i i think in, i think in i think in terms of understanding your experience and and seeing it reflected back at you you know being written about online and there being communities for that like something like galdem like these things did not exist when i was younger and I would have really appreciated them so I like to hope that that is the case obviously it doesn't necessarily change how the situations you might be in like I still think you might go into a corporate environment and be treated in a certain way because you are a young black woman um but I I, I would hope that there are more outlets I think there are more outlets for black women and more places to 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 vent or, or yeah to feel seen more platforms more communities and yeah i i would have loved those when i was younger so i i hope things are better i really hope so thank you so much Tega. i'm gonna sneak in one more which is what would you say that you hope black people get from whites and what would you hope that white people get from whites black people i want to feel vindicated and gratified and like they like I have put into words um, experiences or emotions or feelings that they've maybe had, like unexamined feelings they've had, but not really known how to articulate. Like my favorite kind of writing to read is when I feel like a writer has said something, I'm like, oh, you've gotten it so, like you've nailed that emotional feeling that I didn't even know how to describe. Like I'm hoping that that's what black people get from it and, you know, kind of take some comfort for that and even have the language to describe certain things because I know now that reading certain writers, having the language to describe my feelings where I wouldn't have before, um, like I, I reference the trapdoor of racism in the essay, which I won't explain now, but it's like this phrase that I found really useful that has been really useful for me. So I hope that black people get that. And for white people, I guess I just hope 
that it encouraged them to self-examine much more critically and you know I expect that if they really engage with it they will feel uncomfortable um but yeah I, I that that's kind of those are those are my ambitions for the book in terms of those two audiences thank you so much Ortega so many of the comments are just speaking about they love they love how sort of open you are how much you don't mince your words someone has said that your hair is sweet which I think is a fantastic <laughs> girl I know they're not talking about me so I don't have any <laughs> I saw the cap I saw the cap babe I was like you need a trim I have a trim <laughs> and lockdown means I'm not getting a trim but seriously the level guys Ortega is truly one of the most fantastic people I know one of the most brilliant writers I know and white is a I'm allowed to swear it's off no it's before watershed so it's a mother effing read and you guys seriously it it truly if you whatever whoever you are from whatever background from whatever perspective you will learn that is an absolute fact so make sure you get it out today Ortega it's been yeah, a pleasure yeah. to speak it's to been you been a pleasure. Pleasure. you know I'm gonna voice note you right afterwards but of so course this. one thing I'm gonna say auntie to auntie what is remember to save this video oh my god yeah. If you didn't say that, okay, guys, on that, I'm about to save this. Guys, see, you're, you're really getting the authentic here because this is real time me working out how the hell to do this. So I, how do I, how do I, say <laughs> okay, I know how to do it now. Okay. So I exit. Bye, Ortega. Bye. I later as Bye. I try to save this video. Leave, don't worry, it's, I'll be fine. I'll okay, all right, bye. <laughs> you leave me, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm fine, don't worry. Why are you still here? Right, hang on. God, am I still on this thing trying to <laughs> trying to get that out? Okay, hang on. So I I'll share. Are you still on here? I'm still on here! It's a share to IVP. How do I do that? Wait. Bye bye.